Uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is the second record re-recording of the like uh, lecture on reductions in the Kudamo Discord group. Um, so really, at this point, basically, if you were to sort of carefully study the content from lecture one to lecture eight, you should be fully ready to start like one, authoring uh, CUDA or Trident kernels, uh, integrating them into your PyTorch programs, and then like profiling them and shipping them so people can actually use them. So, uh, and the book sort of follows a similar structure in that like pretty much anything in the PMPP book that's after chapter six uh, is effectively like a case study. So it's basically gonna be something like, here's like a famous algorithm, here's a naive implementation, and you know, here's how to make it faster uh, iteratively. And this chapter is no exception. So it covers like reductions and it sort of like fits really nicely into some of the ideas we talked about in lecture eight which was the performance checklist. So I'd highly recommend you check that out as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you wanna follow along uh, where uh, the content is mostly following chapter 10 from the PMPP book, uh, there's a couple of kernels uh, that I wrote that are all already on GitHub. And you can just like clone this repo locally and CD into the lecture nine repo and just like compile those kernels and then profile them with NCU. Uh, the thing is, like, NCU tends to not work really well on most cloud providers. So either you can run these experiments locally uh, on your own, on your own, like, on your own GPU, uh, or you can still use Lightning AI, which is what I'll be using for these experiments. So at a high level, a reduction is essentially a mathematical operation that reduces the size of the input. So this sounds a bit abstract, but just concretely in a lot of machine learning code, this usually means that like you basically have like a vector and you want a function that produces a scalar. And so there's a couple of functions that do exactly this. There's like the min operation, the max operation, argmax, the argmin, the norm, the sum, the product, the mean, the number of unique elements. There's like all sorts of like reductions that you'll find uh, on, in, in the Torch library. Uh, so specifically here, uh, like let, let's go over a few examples. So for example, one one example of a uh, of a reduction is we're basically going to sum all the elements in a in, in a list, uh, and basically the function that we're applying iteratively is a plus b, and we also uh, have like an accumulator. Like basically, this is the very first value, assuming the list is empty. Uh, so for like a sum, this is usually zero. Uh, so basically you first start with a sum of zero and then for every element that you see, you just like add, add it. Uh, similarly for the product, it's also additive. Like the first element is basically one if the list is empty and then you multiply every other element uh, that's in this list. And similarly, again, you have like max, min, they, they all work the same way. Uh, so much so that like when you're formulating what a reduction is, you can abstract things away and write it in the following way. Like basically a reduction is a function and it has like some sort of identity element. And this identity could be either be zero, it could, it could either be zero, one, float inf, float minus inf. Uh, and then you iterate over the elements in this data and then you iteratively apply like this, this op here and you like basically update result accordingly. Uh, so notice here how res like basically the op takes in the previous result and produces like a new result. So this is where the iterative uh, thing happens. Uh, so the reason I mentioned this is because like this is going to be interesting once we start discussing how these kernels are implemented in a framework like PyTorch, for example. Uh, so in PyTorch, there isn't like a min kernel or a max kernel. There's like a general reduction kernel. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be going over how that works at the, at the very end. Um, and like reductions, even though I went through min and max and, you know, you might think, hey, these are maybe like convoluted examples or like toy examples, but reductions are pretty much everywhere in machine learning code. So like in the example of like convolutional networks, they show up in mean and max pooling because a mean or a max operation is a reduction over a tile instead of a vector. They show up in classification, like basically when you're running a classification, you're essentially taking like an arg max over a couple of probabilities. Uh, it shows up in loss calculations. Like a loss is effectively a scalar that you compute as the difference between like a target and a prediction. So again, it's a scalar. And the softmax itself isn't a reduction because softmax main, like basically it takes a vector and produces another vector. But the normalization is, uh, is, is a reduction because you're gonna be going through basically all, like all of the, 
uh, like all of the elements in a vector. And then you're basically taking the sum of e to the power of, of that element and you're summing all of those up and like dividing and dividing. Uh, so again, show, show shows up pretty much like everywhere. And because they show up so everywhere and they're so ubiquitous, like understanding like what makes them slow and the algorithms that make them fast is just really, really important. Um, so I already mentioned, like, you know, I, I sort of went through examples of how you can implement your own reductions, like in Python. But practically speaking, all of these uh, functions are already in like the PyTorch, like basically in the PyTorch library. And what you can do is you can just like call them, you can just like call them directly. And uh, this under the hood, as long as you're the underlying tensors are like, let's say on a CUDA device, will call the appropriate CUDA kernels or like generate them actually. Um, so yeah, again, this is all just like, you know, spoilers for later. Um, so let's just, you know, start talking about uh, what makes your, like basically how to compute reductions. So this is an example, this is like ASCII art of a, of a, what, like basically a serial reduction. So basically the algorithm that we've been describing so far. So here, for example, we have a vector 5281 and we want to figure out the max of this vector. And the way we would do it is effectively we for loop over this vector and we basically start with a maximum of like negative infinity. And then every time we see a new element, we compare the old max with this new element. And if the max changes, we increment. And so you can see here in iteration one, for example, the max is five. And then once we see two, the max is still five. And then at eight, hey, there's a new max, it's eight. And then we see one, well, eight is still the max. And you would basically just like output like the last element here. So this is like typically uh, an example of a serial reduction. Uh, however, this is not very interesting because, like for us, because if we're running a CUDA program, like ideally we want things to be highly parallelized. Uh, so let's just sort of discuss a strategy to make this go faster. Yeah, so we, we already went through this like general formulation of reductions, so we can skip this. Yeah. So uh, if you can remember, <clears throat> like basically uh, a lot of the kernels that we've been authoring so far, uh, at least like the toy kernels that I personally showed, were examples of what are called like transformation kernels. So for example, let's say you're copying an input, an input into like from an input array to an output array, like CI is equal AI. You would basically have as a th strategy a single thread per data element, uh, and then use that thread to copy like uh, to copy one basically one uh, like one like one chunk of data at a time. Basically, sorry, like one thread per output point. I guess is what they're calling it here. Uh, however, uh, in the case of a reduction, this is a bit more nuanced because in the case of a reduction, so you only have like a single output element. Let's say with a lot of these kernels we talked about. So how do we really assign these threads, right? Like basically we don't want like one thread to be doing the whole reduction because that's just not going to benefit from parallelism. So what are like some better strategies that we can use? Uh, so the sort of most important, basically the foundation for the rest of this lecture uh, is understanding like this slide. So this is basically what's called the parallel reduction uh, algorithm. And the way this works is that we're going to have a vector again, like remember you have like five, two, eight, one, blah. And what we're going to do is for every pair of elements, we're going to assign an independent thread, right? And then what this thread needs to do is it needs to just compare which of two elements is larger. And then whatever is larger, uh, write that to like, maybe like another, like another array. So for example, here, uh, the five and two will be handled by a single thread. Five is bigger than two, therefore five will be put in the first location. And then we have eight and one. Well, eight is bigger than one, so we have eight. So basically what happens here is that uh, at every point and every reduction step, we're going to be reducing the size of the input vector by half, like we're going to half it each time. So we will basically get, you know, one final, like we'll get the final result after uh, like lo log n number of steps. Um, and yeah, basically this is really the, the foundation. So make sure this like makes sense. Uh, so another way to visualize what happened is basically what, in the, what they call in the book, like the parallel sum reduction tree. So this is a different reduction. In this case, it's a, it's a sum reduction. And, but it works the same way. Instead of taking like the max operation between pairs of elements, we're taking the addition element over pairs of elements. 
And we keep doing this until we have like the sum for the for the whole array, which we can see here. Right. So one thing to keep in mind here, uh, especially uh, basically, especially if, if we're starting to discuss floating point numbers specifically, is that a floating point numbers are like non-commutative. Like for example, if you're adding a float A plus float B. Like that's not guaranteed to be equivalent to float B to B plus A, and this is a source of a lot of confusion when people leverage like any machine learning framework like PyTorch, because the expectation is that results are deterministic, but results will be not deterministic for basically uh, two reasons. Like one is uh, weak on GPUs, given that like different threads will be uh, doing doing these steps at different points in time. We can't really control which thread goes first, one. And two, the the order in which a thread basically uh, sums up two elements is you know, not, not always within our control. And that's going to be like another source of like non-deterministic behavior. So that's why like typically if you're using PyTorch and you want really want deterministic behavior, the flag that you'll enable is torch use deterministic algorithms is true. But this is not a free lunch flag because if you make things deterministic, that means you're effectively forcing a certain kind of thread synchronization, as in like, let's say, uh, like basically threads need to go from left to right. Uh, and that and that's going to like basically cause like a certain slowdown. But, you know, that might be OK, depending on the application of like perfect determinism is, is a much more desirable property uh, than speed. So I'm going to go over like a very simple example in non-determinism.py. Uh, so basically here in non-determinism.py, what we're doing is we basically have an array where we have many, many, we have 10 small numbers, basically one to the e to the power minus 20, like a very tiny number. And we're going to have this number show up 10 times. And then we're going to have like a really large, like one, and then like another really large uh, positive number and a really large negative number. So if we sum up this array from left to right, we basically get a value of zero. But if we sum it up in the reverse order, uh, then we basically get like 9.999 to the power e minus 20. And again, this is the, the reason why that's the case is because uh, here we're adding a very small number to a very big number. And this is inherently going to cause like accuracy problems with floats. Whereas if we're adding like a big number to a small number, then th basically from left to right, it'll correctly figure out that this is like equal to, to, to zero. Uh, so this is just like something to keep in mind. Like in this case, we actually got the correct, like the sort of more correct value uh, going from uh, from right to right to left. Uh, but there's like sort of like another interesting thing to talk about, and which is uh, basically the accuracy implications of running reductions. Uh, so if you remember, for example, from the lecture Charles gave on quantization, uh, typically, even even if like let's say you're doing a quantization in int four or int eight or whatever, the accumulations are typically run in a higher in a, in a in higher precision, and the reason why that's the case is because if you're accumulating like many small values in float sixteen, what you could end up with, for example, is uh, like what like yeah. So if if you then if you accumulate many small values in float sixteen, uh, then they just won't have like an impact on on that range, and so. Uh, Basically, the two solutions to this is either use like a number like BF16, which is a, has a higher dynamic range, or you can basically uh, upcast the accumulation in uh, in float 32. So this shows up, for example, if you're running, if you look at the Triton like Matamol tutorial, uh, like for example here in Triton, when they're like running a certain like matrix multiplication. Uh, you'll notice here that like as they're doing the Todd matrix multiplication, the accumulator here is in TL flow 32, even though presumably most of this multiplication is done in flow 32. So basically it's accumulated in flow 32, but then it's hard casted to float 16 such that when you're adding small values to the accumulator, uh, they don't just like disappear. So this is like kind of like another important, these are sort of the two, two like numerical issues that might show up with, uh, with floating point numbers and reductions. All right, so back to the reduction tree algorithm. Uh, remember, this, this is the algorithm we're trying to implement, and we want to implement this in CUDA. And so the basic strategy is going to be, can we have like one thread per each of these, like basically one thread for 4.7 and another thread for 2.3, etc. 
So let's say here, so this is another picture from the book. Imagine now, uh, like imagine now, uh, sorry, let me just get rid of this. Yeah. Uh, imagine now you're basically going to have like thread zero and thread zero is responsible for two elements of data. It's basically going to be responsible for zero and it's going to be responsible for position one. So thread zero needs to add both of those. It adds both of those and then it puts the output, it writes the output back in its current location, like for zero. Uh, then similarly, thread one uh, basically needs to add two and three and it puts them in this position. But basically what ends up happening is that over time, uh, because it's a reduction, basically here, while we might need like one, two, three, four threads, at this step, we only need two, right? So like every step down, we need half as many threads. So here, what ends up happening is thread zero will still be adding position zero, but instead of now adding position one, it's going to be adding position two to itself. And so you basically have like every element and then a thread and then a stride that slowly expands out. So basically a thread needs to figure out like I need to add a, my current position with some position that comes like la later down in the vector. So uh, as you might have guessed, like there, there's kind of like a few problems with this approach. Well, the first one is there's like very high thread divergence here because most threads are doing nothing. Like basically at this like very last step, if we've launched like seven threads here, uh, we only have like one thread that's active uh, and the other, the other six threads are doing nothing. This gets even worse if you assume that the input is really large then you might have like entire warps as in groups of 32 threads, like not doing anything. Regardless, you know, let's implement this algorithm and instead of like having a theoretical understanding of it, let's just like, you know, profile it like always. Uh, so it was called simple reduce. Yeah, so here it's simple reduce. So this is basically like a driver that like chat GPT wrote for me that basically just makes sure to instantiate like basically an input of size 2048. Uh, and then we're get, what we're going to do is basically the input is of size 2048 and every element of this input is just one. That way, if we want to take the sum of that, we know it's going to be 2048. So it just makes it really easy for us to validate correctness uh, of our kernel. And then we're basically going to launch, launch this kernel. So the first thing to keep in mind is that the number of threads that we're launching is going to be half of the, a uh, half of the size of the input, right? Because remember every thread takes care of two of, of two two inputs. So the way this kernel looks like is because basically we want every thread here, we want thread like zero, and then this thread, we want it to be at position two. So instead of just taking the thread index like we're used to, we're gonna take two times the thread index. So basically only the even threads will be active. Uh, and then we basically start with just a stride of one because every element here, so this is, this is the interesting part, basically every thread, will add to its current position i the element that is stride away and the stride starts at one but every step the stride is increased uh it, it's, it's basically 2x and as a result what you get is basically this behavior here where like let's see here the stride is initially one and then you see here now the stride is two and now here the stride is four so you can and then the stride is like eight here so this is what, what this is what this is doing. And you know, let's try running this. So we're gonna go into lectures and then lecture uh, nine. And then I'm gonna NVCC and then I'm gonna create like a like an object, like basically a binary called sum, and then it's gonna be a simple reduce. And before we profile this, uh, let's just make sure it's correct. And indeed it's correct. We we, we got the result we expected. So now if we run and see you sum, uh, we, we notice like basically, okay, like we were getting this grid for this launch, but that's not really what we're trying to measure. Like we don't really care about the grid size. So ah, uh, we remember that instead of calling in CU sum, we want to call set full, which will also give us like benchmarks for uh, thread divergence. And what we notice here is that the branch efficiency is about like 74%, uh, basically. And this, this, and the number of average, like basically we have like 1.19 like average like divergent branches. Uh, so this is like very bad. And ideally we would look to improve this in the next iteration of this algorithm. 
So again, you know, remember here, we've been talking about like thread strategies. So like a thread strategy is how do we decide which threads are handling which, ele which elements at any point in time? So we want like a better thread strategy than this. So uh, the general strategy basically will follow, there's like a few tricks we're gonna use and all of them sort of follow ideas we've already discussed in the performance checklist last week. So these are gonna be control divergence, memory divergence, minimizing global memory accesses and uh, threat coarsening. So let's take a look at like uh, minimizing control divergence. So one idea is instead of like basically having each thread add basically an element that's in its current position and one that's immediately next to it, what if the stride, what if all the threads were next to each other, but then thread zero needs to add itself to this element. So basically a, something that's block dimension away, right? So then here it's going to be like one again, plus plus block dimension, etc. And the benefit of this approach is that at any point in time, all the threads that are active, like basically the threads, like basically at, at this step, it's still going to be like, uh, like, for, like for these two steps, it's still just going to be thread, like these seven threads that are all active. But then here, threads zero, one, and two, and three are uh, co-located. So they're accessing uh, similar, uh, s s s like they're, they're accessing contiguous chunks of memory, which means that we'll benefit a lot more from cache locality. Uh, and we'll also, so basically we're reducing both like memory and control divergence. Uh, so like if we look at this algorithm, like let's try to implement it here. And uh, basically here, the, the, so now we're no longer doing this two multiplication because remember the thread index is just going to be, uh, basically our index is just going to be the thread index. And we still basically uh, have, as, like we, we still launch half as many kernels as the size of the input, like size of two. And the way this is going to work is that the stride starts at the block dimension and at every iteration, we divide the stride by two instead of, instead of multiplying it by two like we used to. So the intuition is we want the stride to be smaller over time, and that's going to make it much more likely for threads to be uh, co-located in memory. So, this, so the idea, though, is very similar. Like basically here, we're still doing an input i, which is the, the basically think of it as the the the, the basically the place in, in, in a vector that is owned by a thread, but it also needs to figure out where, which stride it needs to also add to itself. So that's what this plus equals is. And what we really changed is the way the stride is calculated and the way the thread indexes are, are initialized. So again, so here notice that like the stride here, uh, initially it starts at basically eight, right? Basically here it's going to be like, you know, so like one, two, three, four, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So that's at the first step. But then at the second step, let's say here, the stride is going to be uh, basically here. It's going to be zero, one, it's going to be one, two, three, four. So basically the, the, the stride is getting halved at, at each iteration. Uh, Conceptually, though, it works the same way. Like basically after we, we do this like reduction, uh, so basically after each thread does this operation, we synchronize all of the threads and we keep doing this until we have like essentially like a single, uh, like, 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 a single like a single thread being launched at a time. And if that's the case, then the output is basically the output is just the basically what, what the result is at input zero. So basically the output is whatever is here. Okay, so just remember uh, when we launched this, we saw that the branch efficiency was about 74%. Uh, so now we're gonna try compiling the, uh, the control divergence reduction. Okay, let's make sure it's correct. It's correct. And now we're going to, same thing, we're going to run and see if it's at full sum. Great. And we notice here the branch efficiency went to 99%, right? Uh, so this is really was the problem we're trying to solve. And, you know, we can just visualize it like immediately here. Uh, so, however, there's still more we could do. Like uh, another idea is that so far, 
uh, as we've been working with these vector, we've been basically doing the reductions in global memory. But one idea is we could essentially do the first reduction in shared memory and then have subsequent like writes and reads continue in shared memory. So uh, the implementation for this kernel is here. It's called uh, shared reduce. And basically, uh, we basic, we're basically gonna we're, we're gonna instantiate um, like basically this like this float this input s for input shared memory, and it's of size block dimension, so it can hold a thousand twenty four elements at a time. Um, and then we basically uh, still have this index. You notice here that the first like re this reduction is being done in shared memory now. Uh, and then uh, so your input so. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, no, no. Basically, the, the first reduction only is being, like the first is only is being done in shared memory, basically these input t and input t plus block them. This is the only time we're ever gonna be using global memory in this kernel. So this is what, what this first step is here, like this first green step. But after that, we continue the reductions in shared memory. And the way we do this is very similar. Like we're gonna basically have a stride that's equal to the, uh, basically the, the block dimension divided by two. And then we're gonna have the stride uh, by two at every step. Uh, and then the reduction here is basically looks exactly what it looked like before, but the reduction is happening now in shared memory where again, the basically like the, the current thread index is responsible for its like current location in memory, but also figuring, figuring, figuring out which kernel is like stride away. Uh, so the interesting thing about this kernel is like, if you look here, where was it? We can see the L1 hit rate is 66%. So this was in the previous kernel, like this was without shared memory. Uh, so we would expect this to improve dramatically if we were to run the, the shared memory version of this. Uh, so let's try to run it. So we have NVCC, O, sum, and then shared reduce dot Q, sum. Let's make sure the kernel's correct, it's correct. And then NCU sum. And then we notice here, that the L1 is now like at 60%. So we just already dramatically improved it. However, if you notice the durations were both on the order of like 80 seconds, which is strange because we would have also expected like, hey, we're using shared memory. Therefore, I would expect the kernel to be faster. But it's not faster because the, the kernel is so, basically the inputs is so small uh, that like we're not sort of like seeing necessarily the speed ups. So let's try making this kernel uh, a bit bigger. Let's say it's gonna be 10,000. And I'm gonna try to run the, I'm gonna compile this again, this shared reduce. And now if I run it, interesting, it's saying the sum is zero. So for some reason, when we made our input larger, the kernel became incorrect, right? And the reason why it was incorrect is because this kernel is assuming that the entire input can fit into shared memory, but that is not often the case or even interesting of a use case because the input is small enough, like just a thousand elements, that you could do a very similar operation extremely quickly using a vectorized instructions on a CPU. So this doesn't really justify like why the heck are we spending money on a GPU? Like there should be like a, a better way to do this. And indeed, there, there's an algorithm called the, the basically the segmented multi-block multi -block reduction algorithm, where the main idea of the algorithm is so far we've been launching all of our kernels here, basically with like a single, uh, with a single block. And instead of what we're gonna do is we're gonna launch the kernel with multiple blocks. And then as long as every single block can fit 1,024 elements. We can do the reductions uh, in different blocks and then do a final reduction on all of the blocks at once. So we have like layers of reduction. So let's take a look at what this algorithm might look like. So it's gonna be the segmented reduce algorithm here. It looks very similar. The main difference is that we're now gonna have like two, uh, two indices. One index is going to be basically like the global, uh, like, so one index is going to be like the global index. Like basically, if you were to assume this is this memory position, 
doesn't really care about how things are split up into multiple blocks. And then we're going to have another index that's more local, which is basically within a single block. What are the threads that I'm working with? So basically, the first step that we're going to do is we're going to copy the input index into shared memory. But remember, this is happening in a blockwise way. The second thing we're going to do is we're again going to do the reduction in shared memory exactly like we did before. So basically, we have the stride. Uh, here, where was it? Sorry, greater than zero. Yeah. So again, we're, we're gonna get this, this. We're gonna get the stride be made smaller at every step, and then every every thread is responsible for adding its own its own memory location plus like a distant like a distant memory location from from that's a stride away. And once we're done with all of the once all of the blocks are done, we do a final layer of reductions. Um, in uh, basically in global memory that's basically between all the blocks together and the reason why this needs to be an atomic add is because we don't like basically if multiple blocks are contending for the same location of memory uh, we could get like silent correctness issues and so we basically want to make sure that every time uh, every block is done with its computation that it like locks a position in memory uh, adds its output and then other threads can come in and do the same. Uh, other blocks can come in and do the same. Um, so here, like the perf isn't too important here. Like I think what we care more about is making sure that uh, the kernel is not correct. And if we run this, indeed we have a we have a kernel we have an input of size ten thousand, and now the the kernel is correct. Um, so there's still like one last trick which is going to be like thread coarsening. So the thread coarsening was a controversial performance trick because like in the last lecture, we saw that it made something 35x faster. It's closer to maybe the 2x. It made it 35x faster because we were like measuring kernel launch overhead. And that's why don't use your own timers. Just, you know, you can rely on the duration calculations in NCU or NVIDIA Insight for this. But the strategy here is that so far, we've basically been making sure that every thread basically only adds two elements at a time. But what if a thread adds like four elements or eight elements? Like, like what, why, like, you know, what, what, what could happen then? Um, so that last algorithm is implemented here in reduced coarsening. And the idea here, it looks very similar uh, to what the previous algorithm looked like, uh, the segmented reduce. The main difference is this, like basically, we have multiple layers of reduction now. So the first layer of reduction is we basically reduce within a thread. Like basically within a thread, there's let's say four elements that we need to add to the sum. So go ahead and do that, right? So this is this reduce within a thread. And then once we're, so once we've reduced over a thread, we now need to reduce within a block, right? So now again, we basically, uh, look at li like we basically uh, so this reduces to sort of the previous algorithm that, that we had and once we reduce over a single block we now want to reduce over all the blocks and this is this basically this whole part is just the previous algorithm that we had so this is sort of the, the new part here so this is really nice because like I think when, when you when you look at like an algorithm uh, like this like, like here the thread strategy turns out to be quite nuanced, like as in like basically instead of just like having threads that are always doing the same thing, we basically have a different strategy depending on like basically which layer, like which layer of abstraction, you're. like the thread strategy, it, like at, at the thread level involves, like, could involve coarsening at the block level. It involves like using shared memory. And then if with multiple blocks so that we can like correctly work over larger, larger input sizes, there's also basically another like reduction strategies we might, we might have. Um, so really now, like I think, like I said, like uh, lectures one and eight gave you everything you need to start like writing, profiling and shipping your own kernels in PyTorch. So start picking a project basically. I think now is a good time to start like thinking about an interesting kernel to work on. And if you're unsure what to work on, feel free to reach out to the mods or make a post in general because uh, having collaborators can help uh, keep you motivated. The next lecture uh, next week is going to be Oscar, who's the first volunteer from our group. Uh, and he's going to be talking about his experience shipping production-ready CUDA libraries. 
Uh, and we're also looking for more volunteer lecturers. So basically, I think some important topics might be like trident kernels, uh, prefix sum, uh, nickel, because we haven't really talked about distributed at all, would all be really fantastic topics to cover. And we'd, we'd love to hear from you if you're interested in talking about anything, but specifically those topics as well. So I also had a couple of bonus slides that I wanted to go to, which is how are reductions implemented in machine learning frameworks? So uh, let's say in the case of PyTorch, for example, uh, there's already like a bunch of like user facing ops, uh, like, you know, Torch Max, uh, Torch Min, Torch Mean, whatever. Uh, but like, how are these eventually translated into CUDA kernels? So one thing you might have noticed here is that basically as we come in here, like let's say we have, for example, let's say at the, fine, at the very end, we said, okay, well, we have a, a strategy if the inputs are large. But if the inputs are really small, then none of this makes sense. And it makes a lot more sense to not use a segmented redu reduction. It makes sense to just use a normal reduction. Uh, and then what happens if a reduction needs to work over like a multidimensional array? Like so far here, we're assuming like vectors. Uh, do we need to change our implementations if the D types of the input and the output change? Like, should we change like maybe the D type of our accumulator? Should it be the same D type? So there's sort of like a lot of things you might need to think about uh, if you're trying to have a kernel that works broadly, because if you build a kernel that like works within like a specific, just a specific scenario, that means that your binaries will be massive because you need to have like a kernel checked into your code base per different permutation. And this makes it very difficult to future proof your code. Whereas if you have something that's more code gen and uh, has heuristics to pick the right kernel, then it's very likely that your framework will continue to be a framework that people can experiment with. And that that is kind of like a big part of like what made Python successful. It's basically, we're not sort of saying this is gonna be the winning algorithm. It's more like you provide tools for people to come up with the right algorithms. So, uh, an example of this, of this philosophy at work is basically uh, this like reduce, this is, the, this is the reduce kernel that we have. So one, our reduction kernels, it's not like we have a, a max.qh and a mean.qh, right? We have a single reduce.qh because remember, uh, all reductions have this structure. Like basically reductions are sort of like very mathematically equivalent. And we would want like a more generic piece of infrastructure where we can give it like an identity, basically, or an accumulator and an op, and then code gen the right performance kernel. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that like, if you also come here to reduce config, for example, where was it? Yeah, so here the set reduce config. Uh, where was it? So, for example, in reduce config is when you might set things like the block width, like the block height, the min values per thread, the max values per thread, and all of these heuristics, so that you can make sure that you can generate like the right kernel, like depending on uh, on on the D type. And here, I, I took some notes here quickly. Uh, let me show the interesting thing. Reduce kernel, yeah. Yeah. And then you can notice, for example, oh, yeah, so it seems like, for example, like uh, a lot of these kernels, like you can sort of come in and you can see, okay, well, one, uh, you know, they've been using a parameter we haven't been using in our kernels. They've been using the stream operation because streams let you do, basically let lets you interleave copies. Uh, so we haven't talked about CUDA streams, but again, like so far, we've just been using like this grid and block. Uh, you can also see basically here, uh, how they send in like the max threads and and basically like how, how, like basically the, the kinds of kernel launch hyperparameters that PyTorch picks, like the block size, the grid size. Um, so it sort of like has a lot of interesting uh, a lot of interesting tricks. Uh, that said, it might be a bit tricky to go ahead and understand this because one, this uses CUDA C++ and so far we've been using we haven't been using any C++ features like templates. But templates are nice because then you could potentially have your same kernel. Let's let's say, for example, you can have a kernel work on float 16 and BF 16. 
but you also want to be able to uh, set the accumulator to float 32 so how do you make not how, how do you make it so you're not just like writing a massive number of CUDA kernels all over the place uh, this file has like a lot of interesting lessons for uh, how you might go about uh, doing that as you see here can accumulate an output you know can accumulate an output needs to ensure that the the input or output type is not BF float 16 or half or car. It's basically saying do not accumulate in a BF float 16, right? So, so there's all sorts of cool stuff like I learned like going over this. So I, I highly recommend studying it. Uh, another thing I want to show you is like, so this was in the context of eager where we mostly uh, write CUDA kernels, but within Torch compile, we generate Triton kernels and those are a bit easier to understand. So I just want to show you an example. Uh, so let's say we have this example of a, like, where was it? Uh, compile, compile, reduce compile, yeah. So this is the kernel I want to write. And basically what this kernel does is it just takes the mean of A, which basically needs to take A, basically it needs to take, sum up all of the elements of A. So that's the reduce step. And then it needs to, uh, then it needs to divide it by the number of elements. So that's still a reduction, right? And the number of elements is then. So this is still an example of reduction. And if we run this, uh, I want to look at the actual code that gets generated. Excuse me. Yep. So what you'll notice here is that maybe you need to make the font a bit smaller. Yeah. So what we'll notice here uh, it's here, yeah. So you see this temp5, this is the stem, right? And then we're dividing temp6 by temp4 divided by temp5. So this feels like it's the mean operation. So let's look at what temp4 is. Temp4 seems to be a sum, right? Over, uh, it, it seems to be a sum. And okay, and then there's like, it seems like there's like a bunch of boilerplate here. Like for example, there's like a heuristic, like hey, the like the right block size should be 16. Uh, the number of elements is uh, is 10. And then you'll notice as well that there's a couple of uh, like here, like there's a couple of hints that inductor like torch compile gives to uh, gives to Triton. Uh, one of them is it's saying okay, well this is a reduction. This is a reduction, All right? So it already guessed that this is a reduction and that you need to do. A reduction over the inner dimension so basically do it over all of the elements uh, and then you can see basically how a lot of these heuristics work if you go to this file like the trident heuristics file so we're gonna quickly go to pytorch here Right. And so you notice here, okay, well, it seems like, you know, it's like basically looking at, okay, like, do you get this reduction? I'm so set this flag. If you've disabled pointwise auto tuning, then, you know, these are some like reasonable size hints. And so this is really interesting because, like, as you're working through your kernels, it might be difficult to figure out exactly how you should set R numel or X numel and what should your block size be. So this is quite good as well. You can sort of come in and see how the heuristics change. Uh, and again, I gave you one simple intuition earlier, which is that your heuristics might change depending on the size of your inputs. Like basically, if you have a very small input versus a very large input, the kind of kernel that you're dispatching should probably be very different. Uh, and the other one is basically the D types. Like basically, uh, if you're, even if you're like doing a kernel in like, let's say BF16, you still want your accumulations to happen in float32. And so you, if it's a reduction, you might need to make this hint, but if it's not a reduction and there's no concept of accumulation, then, you know, why, 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 why upcast, right? So this is kind of where this gets cool. I also wanted to briefly show you uh, how this works within uh, Triton itself. So in Triton itself, uh, they had this like uh, interesting function, I thought here, like these two lines where they basically say something we said, which was similar to before, which was, uh, one, you want, when you're doing a reduction, you want to reduce within a thread, like basically, uh, like basically within, so one, we said like it's it, within threads is 
I'm not sure what this means exactly, but if it's like, let's say, if it's coarsened, then it basically reduced over all the course, like or the, the whole course of the thread. If it's multiple threads uh, with like basically a warp, which is you scheduling a group of, th of 32 threads, then you want to first do a reduction within those 32 threads. And then as a next step, what you want to do is this. Basically, you want to do a reduction between all the warps. And then you store, you can see, see this here, like the store, the warp reduce, the shared memory, and then you accumulate the partial reduction and then you load them. Okay, so I see, I see this is, uh, yeah, so this means I think uh, within a single thread and then this is like within, yeah, like all the warps. Uh, Although basically within, within threads and a warp, within warps and a block, and then within blocks, right? So this is the hierarchy we talked about earlier. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much like all I had covered for today. Uh, the main thing I really wanted to stress on is that you know the reductions are implemented using this parallel cell, parallel sum reduction tree, but the challenging part about this is figuring out how to allocate threads uh, to different like chunks of the data, and we learned how to iter iter iteratively do this. Uh, one starting with like pairwise, then coalescing the threads by changing the way we compute strides. Then, you know, we sort of use shared memory, which is a very natural trick. Saw how that makes the results incorrect for large matrices, for large for large vectors. And we finally ended with talking about uh, how to course in uh, threads. So, yeah, I mean, if you enjoyed this thread, please make sure to subscribe. Uh, then uh, make sure to join our CUDA mode lectures. They happen every Saturday at noon PST. Uh, we'd love to see you. And if you haven't gotten started already, please, please start thinking about like writing your own kernels. Uh, that's kind of when you can really, really start learning for reals. And thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your time.